You are watching Apostolic Radio Charlotte, Truth with the Power to Live It. Verse number nine, somebody say, help him, Jesus. Thank you. Now, those who had eaten were about 4,000. And he, Jesus, sent them away, immediately got into a boat with his disciples, and came to the region of Dalmanthua. Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. I want you to notice verse number 12. You won't see this a whole lot in Scripture. But he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. Amen. I'm going to talk about uh, the, 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 the sigh of the Savior. The sigh of the Savior. Somebody say in Jesus' name. I bless you. You may be seated. I am believing for a great year to come, and this is the first Wednesday night of that year, and I hope you all had a wonderful time last night. Someone asked me this morning, did I see the ball drop? I said, was there a ball? <laughs> uh, I, I, I will not tell you what time I went to sleep last night because you will think I'm the most boring person you have ever met in your life. <laughs> uh, but I truly am believing the Lord for a great year to come. 2013 was quite an eventful year for us. We finished uh, the Life Center, and we remodeled the exterior of this church, uh, started the daycare. Uh, it was a lot happening uh, last year, and I'm so thankful that the Lord enabled all of that to happen. It's all good things, and uh, I'm hoping this year, uh, hopefully in the first part of the year, we'll be able to finish our, our interior renovation of this church. Uh, we do need the favor of the Lord, but I won't get onto that because I'm not wanting to put any more weight in my backpack tonight than I already have. And so we'll just believe the Lord to work all that out according to his will. Amen? But you'll help me pray, yes? Thank you. Uh, so a lot of, lot of things to come. I'm looking to see what the Lord will do and not just in our, our church as a, a broad corporate body, but individually in your life. I hope you specifically are praying and looking for the works of the Lord to be done in your life and uh, his, blessing, his, his blessing upon your life. Uh, let me very quickly uh, get into this context of Scripture. Remember, uh, the Lord had left the area of Judea, which is the southern air part of the Holy Land. Let me very quickly give you a way of thinking um, about, about the, the Holy Land. Um, if you were to go to the north, you would be in the mountains of Lebanon. And uh, those mountains, you'll often find them referred to in the Psalms of David. Uh, and that area up there is really modern-day uh, Syria and modern-day Lebanon. Uh, at, in the time of Jesus, that northern area uh, where you had, you'd have Syria to the uh, east and you would have Phoenicia over on the west by the coast, just south of there you would have the first area that you hear a lot about in the Scripture, Galilee. So whenever you hear Galilee, you need to think the north, the extreme north of the Holy Land, right up against the mountains of Lebanon. It's easy to think of those mountains as kind of more like hills, but let me, uh, let me remind you that they are more than hills. Uh, Mount Lebanon is 11,000 feet high. Uh, that's about how high Breckenridge in Colorado is, is, is and uh, I kind of wish I was going there tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's pretty high. 11,000, that's not just a hill. That's, that's higher than any, that's twice as high as any mountain we have on the East Coast. So it gives you some perspective. Those mountains of Lebanon are uh, legitimate mountains. Uh, the, the Mount uh, uh, Hermon is over 9,000 feet high, still twice as high as anything we have on the East Coast. So uh, then you come south, the first area, uh, coming south, which would be the north of the Holy Land, that's Galilee. That's where the Sea of Galilee is. That is where this 
story of Jesus is being told, this time spent in Galilee. If you were to go south from Galilee, uh, you would hit what we think of as Samaria. Uh, Samaria is closer to Jerusalem than Galilee is. Uh, we, we don't think of it much this way, but you could easily make an argument that Galilee was even more distant from uh, the, the, the center of Jewish life than Samaria was. And Samarians were treated as though they were second-class citizens. Uh, and so if you came south of Samaria, uh, this is down through the River Jordan Valley, you would come to Judea. Now, Judea is what you typically think of when you think of where all the action is happening uh, in 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 the scripture because this is where Jerusalem is this is where Bethany is this is where Bethlehem is Hebron uh, etc etc uh, so much of the the journey of the Lord Jesus Christ in the scripture is a north-south journey it is from Judea up through Samaria to Galilee back from Galilee down through Samaria to Judea this is a more a, a, a kind of a regular passage of travel uh, that you will read about again and again Jesus for some time has been in the north up in around the area of the the, the Sea of Galilee um, he got away from the influence of of the Pharisees by going to the part of the country we would refer to as the Decapolis, the ten cities that were largely uh, Greek influence, not Hebrew influence, but Greek, and much less representation of Pharisees there. And just in the same manner he had fed the 5,000, he fed the 4,000. Slightly different audience, not a lot of Sadducees and Pharisees, much more Greek uh, speak, speaking people, uh, but uh, very much the similar kind of miracle. And I would remind you, this all started with that lady who challenged uh, the, the uh, his uh, his faith. The Syrophoenician woman she he, she challenged him with her faith, not his faith, and uh, challenged him that even the little. Uh, dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And this starts, he had gone here to rest. He had gone here to spend time in, with his disciples to, to grieve for the death of John the Baptist. But that lady's faith starts a chain of miracles in this very re region where, uh, remember, the people of Gadara asked him and said they didn't want him there. Uh, and uh, a chain of miracles that will not just be to the house of Israel, it will be to Gentiles also begins at that woman's faith and continues all the way down through the feeding of the 4,000. After this, he goes to the region uh, that Mark, Mark is the only one in all the Gospels who calls this part of the country by this name, Dalmathua. Um, everyone else calls this area Magdala. Uh, if you will remember Mary uh, Magdalene, she is from Magdala, or she is from this area, Dalma Nutha. Um, it is the a part of the uh, right on off of the the Sea of Galilee, <clears throat> and Jesus there is met by Pharisees, uh, and these Pharisees pick up right where they had left off. Remember, very quickly. Jesus had tried for some time not to have a lot of conflict. And finally, about the third chapter of the book of Mark, he gives up trying, and he starts openly challenging the Pharisees and uh, their ilk. Uh, he had tried to do miracles on days they wouldn't be offended. He had tried to do it in areas they wouldn't be offended. But you can't get along with some folks. And he decided, okay, I will quit worrying about your sensibilities. He pursued by them by the crowds, finally left to get away and take his disciples to this area of the Decapolis, and now he has returned to an area that has a lot of pharisaical influence, and they come out and they immediately, they don't say, hi, how you doing? They don't say, hope you had a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Uh, of course, they wouldn't have said that anyway, but you get the idea. They don't say any of that. They immediately begin to dispute with him. Here, uh, they've already decided, they have already painted him as their enemy. They already decided he has nothing to offer them, and they now are seeking only 
to trap him, to trick him, to make him look bad. And so they begin to dispute with him. They have challenged him all the way from Mark chapter number 2 all the way up to this moment, and they will continue to challenge him all the way up until they deliver false witness, trick the Roman powers that be, and have him crucified, an innocent man, uh, that their own fears and insecurities may be satisfied. Uh, Mark points out in this in a parallel passage uh, in chapter 16 of his book, they are joined here by, by Sadducees. So you have both Pharisees and you have Sadducees uh, questioning Jesus, criticizing Jesus, and trying to challenge his divinity by saying, if, if you really have this kind of power, would you show us a sign? If you really had this kind of, sh prove to us, uh, they are well beyond the place where they're going to be convinced by anything. Remember the story of, 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 of Lazarus and, and the rich man, and he said, send someone to my brothers, and, and the, the word comes back. Um, Even if a, a, a Lazarus who was raised from the dead came to tell your brothers, they would not believe. The Lord knows the heart. I don't know the heart, and you don't know the heart, but the Lord knows the heart. And for some people, not even a miracle is enough. They will not believe. You're not arguing with their intellect. You're not arguing with their logic. You're arguing, arguing with their will. Now, as believers, we oftentimes try to witness to people. We try to, 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 to put in a word uh, that would encourage them in a spiritual direction. And I will be the first to tell you, and I'm sure many of you would immediately agree with this, it can be tremendously frustrating trying to, to talk to someone. In fact, it, has, it is to the point in American society that if you bring the subject up in a pushy manner, it's considered rude. Uh, they might be nice to you at that moment, but they will get with your other friends and your other coworkers, and they will talk bad about you. You have to wait until an opportunity comes where it's what you might say socially acceptable. Uh, I don't know how we've got to this point, in, uh, but it's not just me saying, this. This is common accepted. Uh, if you were to try to just of your own inst in instigation and your own decision, actively try to, to put on them um, uh, uh, a type of biblical debate or uh, put on them a, a disagreement or put on them any kind of a guilt trip, you would close more doors than you would open. And so we are living in a time where if we're going to win souls, we have to be wise. Can I have an amen? There's a right time Time, there's a right way, and usually the best, safest way starts with compassion. There is opportunities that come to you in friends and loved ones who are going through a time, and if you want to be a witness to them, don't start by hitting them over the head with the Bible. I promise you it's not going to be well received. You start with compassion. Jesus saw the needs of the crowd, and he was moved with compassion. If we can start there, then charity will do for us what a debate about interpretation will never do for us. You guys here tonight? This is a challenge because we have to become experts at the acceptable, the socially acceptable, the sensitive, the non-offensive uh, uh, manner of introducing God into the conversation. Uh, I, I, in my own life, I have, I have tried several different ways to bring it up. Uh, and I, like many of you have, and you've learned some lessons, that's not how you're supposed to bring it up. <laughs> and uh, then there's been times where you wish you would have been more bold because there was, in hindsight, there was an opportunity, but you didn't exactly know how to bring it up. I, I, would, I would say, at least my own experience is this, compassion is always a good opportunity to mention the name of Jesus. Because people in times of need are not ready to debate theology, but they are ready to receive the love of God uh, into their need and into their life. So uh, here you see uh, Jesus dealing with these Pharisees, these Sadducees. They're demanding a sign. They're testing him. And I would like to point out to you just how frustrating this must be to God. You see, here's the deal. God knows what you really need not what you think you need. 
You see, you know what you think you need. God knows what you need. God also knows what you think you need, but he doesn't always agree with what you think you need. Uh, some of you saw that uh, recent Powerball that got up to uh, near $300 million, whatever it was, and you need, decided you needed that Powerball ticket. Uh, but the Lord didn't think you needed that. And you're still a little irritated about it. <laughs> uh, the Lord knows what we really need. How frustrating must it be to God to look at our hearts and see that in the area of our most important need, we are starving. And in all of these areas that are of minimal importance, we are well fed and fat. You understand what I'm saying? How frustrating must it be from the perspective of heaven? Jesus is beginning. Uh, the Bible says he grew in knowledge and in favor with God and man. There had to have been a time where he did not understand in totality what was required of him. There had to have been less than perfect knowledge in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, it would have been impossible for him to be in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Can I have an amen? I know there are some apocryphal literatures uh, that is not in the canon, the authorized canon of books where stories are told fantastical in nature about Jesus almost having this mystical ability to turn rocks into doves and whatnot. Uh, that is not in the canon. It, it has problems to it. But I, I would remind you of this. The Lord grew in grace and in knowledge. He grew in understanding. I do not know at what point of his ministry he came into understanding understanding of every relevant issue. But I will take you all the way to the end of his earthly sojourn and tell you there were still things he did not in his flesh understand with perfect comprehension. Otherwise, why would he lift his eyes heavenward and say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, so there is a, grow, a growing understanding of what is required of him. Prayers in Gethsemane would not always make perfect sense if he is saying, uh, uh, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. He would have already known there's no other way. But what you see is the flesh, the dual nature of the Lord, the flesh of God coming into understanding of the deity, the challenge of uh, the deity. And you say, well, doesn't that play into Trinitarianism? Absolutely not, because they say the Son is co-equal with the Father. How could he not know? You see what I'm saying? The problem is not fixed whatsoever by trying to go to Trinitarianism. It's made more complicated because now you have a co-equal son giving up a portion of his knowledge so he can suffer as a man when you could much easier, e easier say uh, it's God in man and it is uh, Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. So, uh, let me not get off into that. There's a lot there. We'll maybe do that another time. So, he, you see his frustration. People, the Pharisees, he can see their heart. He has tried to take some time away to rest, to recover as it were. And he comes back and the same problem is staring him right in the face. The exact same problem is staring him right in the face. And what you see him do is when they say, oh, give us a show, entertain us, prove to us you're the one. He has been given signs nonstop ever since he declared his ministry. He's just been not been giving the signs they want. Watch this. He's been given the signs Isaiah prophesied. He's not been giving them the signs they want. He's been giving them the, so the signs that the psalmist prophesied he would give them. And he lives out before them the fulfillment of Isaiah. He gives them a sign. It's just not a sign they want. They want something fantastical. And so he sighs deeply. Let's talk about sighing. Uh, sighing is the opposite of exploding. You guys know what I mean? Uh, most of you probably do not have temper problems, but most of you do have a temper. Turn around to your neighbor and say, yep, he's preaching to you now.
Stay with me a few more minutes. I'm not going to keep you too long tonight. Most of you don't have temper problems, but most of you have a temper. And when your temper hits, you have a choice you have to make in that moment. You're either going to control it or it's going to control you. My God. Mm. I knew I was wise, but sometimes I surprise myself. <laughs> Just having fun. You're either going to control it or it's going to control you. And the temper's response is to explode. You want to take, you want the perpetrator of your frustration to feel the emotional response of your suffering. And so when they provoke you, like for example, you're sitting in the traffic and you've been in your polite lane for hours and Billy Bob Joe comes driving all the way down. It took you 20 minutes to get where they go to one lane and they come all the way down and they cut all the way and then they're going to force themselves right in front of you because they, they can't be late. Well, you're late too. They just get to be dramatic about it. You see, that's... I will confess to you, I have been known a time or two of my life to find the shortest lane, run down, put on my blinker, and I never force my way in, but there's always souls who sometimes will let me in. I don't do it every time, but I'm not going to act too innocent because you wouldn't believe me if I did. <laughs> Your temper wants to say, hey, buddy, we're all waiting. The only one who thinks you're special is your mama, and she ain't here. <laughs> so quit being a narcissistic blowhard and get in line. That is so satisfying. Except it isn't. Your blood pressure is now up. Your heart rate is now up. And you think to yourself, if that dude's crazy with a firearm, this could get ugly real fast. <laughs> What is a sigh? A sigh is an opposite of an explosion. You can't fix it. You can't even agree. And so rather than explode, you take a breath and you try to breathe it out. Now, it's different when you're fighting with your wife. When she sighs, what it means is you're an idiot. That's different. <laughs> Oh, the guilty laugh makes me laugh. Uh, women are experts at insulting you with a sigh. It's totally different. Uh, but uh, you guys understand what I'm saying. Some of us guys do that too. But when you're in this social conflict situation, you can explode or you can just try to breathe it out. Jesus puts all of the frustration in uh, at this that's, he's filling in his heart at these Pharisees. He puts it into a sigh. There is a sigh in chapter number seven. We talked about that three weeks ago. There's a sigh in chapter number eight. Chapter number eight, he's frustrated with the disciples. It's the same old, same old. They want a sign. They're not interested in anything but their own interpretation. They're not interested in their own plans. They don't see anything beyond that which is immediately in front of them. And they will commit sin in order to claim they are righteous. And he sighs. The anguish that he feels is something that is not a shallow, uh, a shallow instigation or a shallow. It's something deep from within him. And so he is grieved, you might say, at the hardness of their hearts. Remember Mark chapter number three, we talked about that. The scripture says, verse number five, Jesus is grieved at the hardness of their hearts at their hearts. In chapter number seven, we talked about that. He sighs as he heals the deaf mute. He tried the traditional. They was believe there was healing power. It doesn't work. He sighs. He looks heavenward and he says, be opened. In other words, what the flesh and the efforts of the flesh fail to do, the power of the spirit can do in a moment. So it is in our lives. In uh, John chapter number 11, the Bible says that he groaned in his spirit when he saw the grief of others. In Luke chapter number 19, we, we know and we have often uh, thought about 
uh, how he wept over the city of Jerusalem. Uh, he looks at these Pharisees and he sighs. And so my question, and what I'd like you to spend a few moments thinking with me about here tonight is, is simply this. How do we frustrate God? When heaven sighs at the errors of the earth, when heaven sighs at the stubbornness of the earth, when heaven sighs at our unwillingness, our unbelief, our, our stiff-necked uh, nature, when heaven sighs, how is it that we are provoking God. Uh, let me remind you of the, the message to the churches in Revelation chapter number 2. He knew their works, he said. I know your works. And he sends a letter but uh, to those churches. And we're blessed even today by, the, by those letters that we have. What if the Lord wrote you a letter and it started like this? Dear so-and-so, I'm a little bit frustrated. What if, what if, what would the Lord frustrate, be frustrated with in our lives? Let me give you a few things that are in the scripture where you can see him frustrated and then we'll apply it to our lives. Um, you can read in Matthew 11, uh, a passage, uh, verse 28 through 30, where you see uh, this this frustration of the Lord. Let me let me just just for the sake of the context, let me read that to you. Matthew chapter number eleven, verse number twenty-eight. Come to me, all you who labor. Am I in the right place? Matthew eleven and twenty-eight. Yes. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light we love that passage we quote it one to another but how many surface services have we come to and we leave just as heavy as we came how many times have we come to an altar and we say we're going to lay it down we've been carrying it long enough we're going to lay it down but we lay it down for a little while and we feel better because we, you know we had a moment's rest and we're going to go walk out and we pick it up one more time how frustrating must it be to heaven to see us struggling over and over and over with that which we claimed we laid down the day before and here we have the clear promise of the lord that there is peace in his presence, that we can lay our burdens upon him. His, his yoke that he puts upon us is not a burdensome thing, uh, but it is, it is to our benefit. It is easy, and the burden is light. When we refuse to hear the clear teaching of Scripture over and over and over, it must be very frustrating to heaven. Secondly, when... When our lifestyle, the, the sinful flesh, when, it, when our lifestyle doesn't differ from the world we live in, uh, it must be very, very frustrating to God. Uh, God's made a big investment in you. Can I have an amen? He's already paid a price that you might have victory. Uh, and then to see us not use the power of God in our life and struggle with the same things over and over and over when right there, if through faith we could activate the power of God in our life, how frustrating must that be to heaven? Uh, uh, number three, uh, when we fail to, to, to have charity one for another uh, or we fail to show uh, the love of God, how frustrating must that be to heaven? Uh, we, we all know the scripture that says, by this shall all men know you are my disciples, that you have love one toward another. And we all know the teaching of, of Matthew chapter number 6 and verse number 33, where the, the, the passage tells us, um, but, but uh, hold on, I'm, I, I'm on the wrong scripture. Um, uh, Matthew 5 and 44, the, but this I say to you, this is some heavy teaching, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Why? That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. There's no doubt Christianity is involving all of those things. Can I have an Amen. There's no doubt that our life must manifest the love of God and one to another. It must manifest charity or we're just playing church. We know that. 
And yet, and yet the flesh, the flesh finds a way to frustrate heaven. And then the next frustration to heaven, when we, we don't let the kingdom of God be the, the number one priority in our life. I, as I mentioned uh, from 33 of, of verse 6 here, but seek ye fur of chapter 6, which, verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you. That's fun to quote. It's fun to preach. It's even fun to sing. Kind of hard to live. A lot of our troubles come, not because we miss the complicated, but because we miss the simple. And uh, when tribulation comes to us, and uh, imagine how the angels feel. You see, angels don't have to have faith. They see God as he is. So it is 100% reality to them. We're the one who see through a veil of faith. And when we are discouraged because of setback, imagine how frustrating that must be to heaven because they see that it is our honor and privilege to bear tribulation and persecution. It's right in the scripture. Oh, but it's hard for us to live. Uh, when anxiety and fear stops our spiritual potential, how much frust how must, how frustrating must that be to God? When we have opportunities that come to us, you know, opportunities are rarely endless in time. Opportunities are usually a moment in time. There may be a potential within any of us for a spiritual gifting or a spiritual uh, a ministry in a, a specific way, a specific style, or one of the gifts of the Spirit. That, that might be opened in a much longer time scale, but so much of our opportunities in God, they are a moment in time. And we have prayed for months, Lord, open up the door and I'll do a work for you. Lord, show me where to, where to work. And all of a sudden, here is a wide open door and we don't even see it. How frustrating must that be to heaven? On and on and on. When discouragement causes us to either quit praying or quit coming to church. That's when you need to pray. And that's when you need to come to church. I hate to see people, they go through a loss, the first thing they do is they start missing a lot of church. They, they lose their job, first thing they do, they start missing a lot of church. The very thing that would help them is what they will not take. It's like a toddler taking medicine. That toddler would rather die than take that medicine. They'll fight and kick and spit, and you never heard such in your life. They don't want to take that medicine. And so you come up with all kind of games. You get drinks, and you get a little bit of this. We give my son some medicine. We have to get a syringe in this hand, and we have to get a drink in this hand. And we give him a millimeter and give him a drink. Give him a millimeter and give him a drink. Yeah, and we get it all down. It doesn't taste good. Frustration doesn't taste good, does it? Setback, financial struggle. But the very thing that would help us make it, prayer, that spiritual discipline, and being in the house of God, all of a sudden, the very thing that would help us, we stop doing. How frustrating must that be uh, to God? There's so many of these. My point in naming them is not to give anyone here a sense of failure or a sense of of uh, discouragement. That, that's my, not my intent at all. My, my intent is for us to become as much as possible uh, spiritually wise and not see things from the perspective of our emotions, not how they feel. You cannot trust your feelings, but then you knew that, right? You cannot go by how you feel, but then you knew that, I hope, right? Uh, you cannot look at events from the perspective of your emotions. You have to look at them through the aperture of faith. Amen. So, here we see a frustrated Jesus. I'm not going to get into the, the Pharisees and the leaven of the Pharisees. That's the next thing in the passage. We'll talk about that next week. I want us to say this. If nothing else in 2014, if we could see things spiritually... We not only ourselves would be blessed, we not only would bless others, <laughs> but we would not frustrate heaven. And I don't know about you, but I want this to be the kind of church where God says, those folks get it down there. <laughs> they see. They don't look simply through confusion. They don't simply look through doubt and fear. 
but they, they really strive to see heaven's view. That's what we've got to see. Can I have an amen? amen. Let's all stand. Amen. Let's worship the Lord right now. Lord Jesus, we praise you and thank you for who you are and what you have done. We desire you in our lives. We long for your blessing above everything else. I pray for your help and your anointing in my own life, and I pray for your help and your anointing in the lives of every one of these believers. I pray a special blessing on them. They came out to the house of the Lord on this holiday evening to learn of you and consider your word. Let us grow in understanding. Let us see things with spiritual perspective. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Find someone, shake their hand. Tell them you don't want them frustrating the Lord like they've been normally doing in the past. Thank you for watching Apostolic Radio Charlotte. Truth with the power to live it.